Thank you all for joining in on the webinar. We're real uh, pleased to be able to report the findings that we've had thus far from a project that we're calling the application of high resolution climate models to benefit avian conservation in the prey pothole region. Today, John Stam and I will be making the presentation. We'll be talking a lot about Valerie Steen's work, but she was not able to be here. So the prairie pothole region of North America has historically been a very important area, especially for breeding waterfowl that's been recognized for many decades, perhaps as many as 50% of all the breeding waterfowl in North America breed in the prey pothole region. This region uh, came into existence in its current state about 10 to 12,000 years ago as the Wisconsin glaciation receded and left uh, small depressions that filled with water. They're currently, depending on the area that you're talking about, um, about five to eight million wetlands in this region. The prey potholes not only is important for waterfowl, but we've in the last decade found out that it's extremely important stopover habitat for northbound migrating shorebirds, and especially a lot of the small peeps or the calidrous species. And as you can see, the white rump sandpiper and the semi-palmated sandpiper travel very long distances, and many of them stop throughout the prey potholes. There are many other wetland-dependent birds in this region, 19 families, 116 species, many of which are in four families, the Anatidae, ducks and geese, the sandpipers, the Laridae, the gulls and the terns, and there are several uh, songbirds that are very dependent on wetland areas as well. So we wanted to look at how climate change might be impacting this full suite of birds. So the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center has funded a three-year project, and there are several PIs on the project. And we're looking not only at the birds, but the climate, the ecosystem processes, and the links between those processes and the bird communities. So today we're going to focus the talk on just two pieces of this, the climate component that was done by John Stamm, Parker Norton, and Gary Clow, and one of the avian components that was done by myself and Valerie Steen. Before we get into those more in depth, we want to um, briefly uh, review the work that was done in some of the other components. So first, E.J. Fontaine and his student Ryan Stutzman, some work done by myself and Lucy Burris on wetlands, work done by Brian Tangan and Robert Gleason on wetlands, and also by Jonathan Friedman. So I'm going to launch first into uh, a couple of these, and then I'll turn it over to John. So T.J. Fontaine and his student Ryan Stutzman uh, have looked at a project looking at avian migration in the face of an altered landscape. And as you see, there's grassland landscapes. There's also uh, tilled agriculture. And looking within the context of competition, food availability, and predation risk, they wanted to look at what habitat cues the birds were using, how they selected those habitats, with the specific questions of how has habitat alteration affected the stopover decisions, and what are the implications of them using some of these altered habitats. Lastly, they're currently working on how climate change may affect local phenology. One of their main findings that I think is, is very intriguing is that the migrating shorebirds, so not the breeding shorebirds, the migrating shorebirds, especially the small ones, exhibit a strong preference for agricultural fields rather than grasslands. So these are the wetlands embedded in these habitats. And among the ha agricultural fields, there's a strong preference for soybeans rather than corn, and that has many implications for what the future holds. Okay, a second component of the project was a wetland component, and Lucy Burris, Diane Grandforce with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I did a project trying to estimate the uh, amount of sedimentation that's going to be impacting uh, the wetlands in the prey pothole region over the next century. And this was a large-scale project using uh, GIS and a lot of external databases. We used a revised universal soil loss equation and a newer uh, 
uh, model, the universal stream power erosion deposition model. And basically, our most conservative models predict that within the next century, upwards of a third of the wetlands will probably completely fill with sediment. And maybe upwards of a quarter to a half will fill by half with sediments. And many wetlands will exceed a sedimentation rate at which aquatic invertebrate and seedling emergence is suppressed. We found that the landscape covariates were more important in influencing sedimentation rates than the climate variable of annual precipitation here. So it's, a, again, a reminder that even though climate change is impending and we're all very concerned, I think we have to keep uh, note the changes in land use affecting our ecosystems. Now I'm going to turn it over to John to describe the next um, two pieces and then launch into the climate section. Yeah, this is John Stamm. I'm with the South Dakota Water Science Center. And uh, I've worked a little bit on uh, this project with Brian Tangan and Robert Gleason up in Northern Prairies. Brian did the majority of this work. He uh, developed a tool uh, to simulate uh, salinity in some of the wildlife refuges uh, in North Dakota and South Dakota and off into Montana. Uh, so it was a uh, uh, water and salinity balance model. I developed it with uh, the uh, that managers could maybe use it. So it ends up being a spreadsheet model. So it's something that they can t grab and use and try to manage some of these impoundments that get a lot of evaporation and can get pretty darn salty. Uh, he did a lot of validation, and he also did a, a simulation on a, a climate scenario. Uh, he didn't really uh, make any conclusions on that, just kind of demonstrated that it could be used for that, and then demonstrated that it could be used for management goals and objectives along those lines. Uh, there's the where you can find that pub if you're interested. The uh, um, wetlands they looked at is Bedoina, Montana. That's where he did the, the demonstration of climate scenarios. And then Long Lake in North Dakota and Sand Lake in, uh, in South Dakota on, off the Missouri River. Actually, it's on the James. So this, this next project is one that I, uh, I was not involved in, but I've done some work in paleoclimate and so on. And Jonathan Friedman did this work on cottonwood trees. Cottonwood trees typically kind of live right along the edge of the floodplain. Um, so they're kind of subject to erosion, floodplain erosion. And uh, so this is a, uh, uh, he, he did a, a study of cottonwood trees. If you look at this slide out here, he's got some really old ones, oldest one out there that's recorded 371 years old. And typically what you expect is they get a lot younger and then they kind of get lost, they get eroded away over time and die, so you get less and less. So you should see this exponential decay, but there's these bumps these bumps tell you that either climate change or the hydrology changed. So we did a, a, a study looking at these cottonwoods to see where there may have been a, a, a times when the floodplain was really growing and climate may have changed a bit. Uh, that's right about the uh, end of what's called a little ice age. Okay, so this is where kind of getting into some of the stuff. This is going to be to some extent a digression uh, to some. Uh, but uh, Susan asked me to talk a bit about climate trends and projections. Um, and so, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I'd like to kind of acknowledge some of the folks that I've worked with. Parker Norton, a grad student uh, at, at South Dakota School of Mines, he's doing a lot of the work on this stuff. He also worked directly with us at the USGS office up there in, in South Dakota. Uh, Bill Capehart, his advisor, uh, and he's uh, consulted with us on some of this work. And Gary Clough. Uh, he's in, in uh, Boulder uh, and with the USGS Earth Surface Dynamics Program. I'll talk about him a little bit more and also uh, associated with INSTAR. Uh, he does a lot of work up in the Arctic and Antarctica. He goes down there and works with those fun ice cores. Um, so I'm going to start talking about some of the historic trends just to kind of put things in perspective, right? Uh, you want to take, you want to have something to compare to. Well, actually look all the way back to 1901 with some of these trends looking in the Great Plains and the prairie potholes. Um, and then I'm going to look at climate projections going out to 2050 uh, and to, with some of the models even going out to, to 2100, to the end of the century. 
Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of focus in on what was going on in the prairie pothole region. So the, the historic trends, I might go through this relatively quickly, skip through it, but a lot of people probably have used this data, this parameter elevation regressions on independent slope data called PRISM. It is gives you estimates of monthly total precip, monthly mean max temperature, and monthly mean minimum temperature, maximum mean temperature and precip. And it's on a grid. It covers the whole lower 48 states, and it's a 2.5 arc minute spacing, about four kilometers. Uh, it is basically it's weather station records that got interpolated. Um, it's more complex than that, but let's just say that for now, and it's pretty available. You can just get these ASCII ARC GIS grids and bring it in and manipulate the data. It goes all the way, way back to actually 1895, the, 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 uh, uh, those gridded formats for every month and all those years. And I just put this up here just to give you an idea of what it might look like. Uh, this is, uh, I've been doing some trend analysis, and, and this is a prism, basically the mean of annual precipitation from 1901 to 2000, the 20th century there, right? And uh, just to show some of the resolution, you know, the pixel size, you can get an idea of just the, the kind of uh, variability that you can see at that scale, that 2.5 arc minute scale. There's the prairie pothole region where I kind of worked with. Susan is going to cut it off a little bit, not have this Montana stuff, but I'm going to show you this full area right here uh, in red uh, as we look at trends and also look at some of the climate model stuff. So if I were to average up all the points for every year in that prairie pothole region, I'd get an average for each year of what the mean annual temperature was, basically averaging min and max, right, in this case. And then um, the total annual precipitation for every year, right? You can see the dust pole dry, a little bit dry here. It's not as pronounced as if you went south and you can see it's hot. Uh, so we're going to compare things to this, to the, the precip trend, and to the temperature trend. And just to give you an idea, if we just put a linear line through there, uh, about a degree per century increase uh, over that uh, that time, and uh, 59 millimeters per 100 years per century. That's the general trend that we've been seeing in the prairie pothole region. OK, so climate projections. I'm going to talk about global climate models and then talk about some of our more regional and statistical downscale models. They're called global climate models, but that's a little bit maybe unfair these days. It's more than climate. They simulate up oceans. They simulate up the atmosphere. They have biosphere components. So to some extent, they're called Earth systems models now. But back then, when we started working on this, they basically called them global climate models. Some people refer to that as GCMs. But actually, GCMs refer to general circulation of the atmosphere, general circulation model. So these global models are dynamical models. They're simulating up the fluid dynamics of the atmosphere, all those Newtonian kind of equations, right? Thermodynamics. Uh, and they're doing it for the atmosphere and the ocean. They're simulating the ocean currents as well. And they, there's these general equations of how the atmosphere behaves, big movements of the atmosphere, the general circulation of the atmosphere, fronts moving, air masses moving. And that's what those are solving. So these are sometimes called AOGCMs and more recently Earth Systems Models. I'm not going to go any more into that. That could be a whole other talk, but I think many of you have an idea of the, the complexity and how those work. Now, you set up experiments, and there was the uh, coupled model intercomparison inter project that said, let's all do the same kinds of experiments. So I'm going to show you the experiments that set up by the coupled model intercomparison project back in 2003 called CMIP3. Right? And they said, let's first simulate pre-industrial climate sometime in the late 1800s. Pick a year, for example, 1870. And you simulate it over and over again and try to get the model to settle down and get a stable climate for 1870. And then you start running an experiment where you start simulating up uh, how that model of the planet would behave if I increase greenhouse gases based on the observed increases that I see. Now, we're not trying to simulate the historic climate precisely. We're trying to simulate what a climate system, where greenhouse gas is going, that, how the Earth would behave like. It's kind of too expensive to, to precisely simulate up and maybe even impossible. So it's not called historic climate. It's called contemporary climate. 
because you're simulating what climate is like. So that takes from 1870 to, to 1999 back then, right? Uh, gives you an idea of when these models are being run and, and set up. And then projected climate is then taking, we don't know what the future is. We're going to have a, a, a mission scenarios that may go several different directions of what the future is. So we don't call it future, we call it projected because we don't really know what the future is, but there are many tracks each one of these projections that we might go, and in these models, these general circulation models that go out to 2100. So projected climates are based on emission scenarios. The CMIP-3, I'll just give a, a kind of a, a cruise through on what we mean by these emission scenarios. So emissions are driven by population technology, land use, other things. What's more important, the environment or the economy, right? A is the A's family of scenarios that where the economy is more important and B, the environment. And are you going to respond globally all the same or are you going to have regional responses? People are kind of behaving differently. So if I take A and B and 1 and 2 and look at all those combinations, I get these families of scenarios. And we've been using the A2 scenario, and I, and in part that's because a lot of some of the previous dynamical modeling that was starting up was using that as well. I want to compare things. In the new CMIP-5, which came out, the new set of experiments, you're going to hear representative concentration pathways, RCPs, instead of these things. And by the way, A2 is not the worst case scenario. The worst case in this is A1, where everyone's using fossil fuels, <laughs> the whole world. Well, that's, that's kind of the worst case in this. Uh, just to put this in perspective, here's CO2 concentration in parts per million. And then here's years going back from 1870. This is the community climate model out of NCAR. Uh, and everyone's kind of using these. And there's our A2 scenario, how CO2 changes. Other greenhouse gases are changing too. We're doing a lot of simulations out to 2050. And you notice that the A family doesn't really, there's really the same at that point. So A1 and A2 are pretty much the same things uh, at that point. So you're getting kind of twice the bang for your buck. This is what the model looks like. So here's this black line is going back to that prism data for the Great Plains now. Now I'm showing for the whole Great Plains of what uh, temperature and precip the black line for prism would be. And here's uh, an example of one general circulation model, the CCSM model version 3, CCSM 3, of how it's, it's kind of following the same kind of pathway what climate is like for the modern, but uh, uh, it, it seems to be off a bit in, in uh, uh, you can see, in precipitation. This is our contemporary climate period. Here is, right, our projected climate period for this model setup. Now I'm going to digress again a little bit, and I'm doing this because I often get this kind of question when I'm talking about. So I'll show this to a manager or show this to a lot of different people. And let's just take, I'm saying that temperature is looking pretty good. Well, a lot of people look at this and they say, uh, I think it's kind of lousy. Look, at it's, it's down, it's here, and you're saying it's down there. And this gets into this realm of, of simulating what climate is like as to simulating um, uh, how climate, um, I'm sorry, simulate what climate is versus what climate would be like. That's kind of the difference between a forecast and a climate scientist. Now, just to kind of maybe put an example in that we're trying to model the behavior of climate instead of forecasting exactly the ups and downs in climate. And maybe a way for me, to, for you to all think about this is, I just kind of give this as an example. And we'll see. I'll put it out there. So if I'm out and I walked my dog yesterday, and I say, okay, I want to do a simulation of me walking my dog yesterday. Well, what's the best model that I could develop of me walking my dog? Well, it's me and my dog, and I walk it today, right? Now, so I can go out and I can walk again and I can walk along that same path. But my feet not fall in the same place. But I'm still going along the same path. And my dog may not have smelled the same tree, but it still goes and smells the tree. So my behavior is the same, but I'm not getting it exactly the same. I'm a good dynamical model of me walking the dog, and I didn't get it quite the same. 
But maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe you just want to model the behavior of the system. So a forecaster might say, okay, I want you to follow exactly every step you followed last time. But a climate experiment would say, well, I don't care that you hit every step, but I want to make sure you followed the right path. So it has value in that. Even though I'm not hitting it, it's showing you how the, how the Earth system behaves. So that's just give you a little bit of an idea of why those curves don't match, because it's an experiment of behavior of climate as opposed to a prediction of exactly what climate was. So we might start being close to the same footsteps, and then we start to diverge, and then we kind of go out in the future, and I could check out if my feet are kind of going right in the right right section of time where I actually got observations. All right, so we got these global models, and now we have to make a decision of using regional versus statistical models. And just put some things out there. This is considerations we had. What kind of time resolution are, are we needed? Do we need, I was hearing a lot of people saying, I'd like to get hourly and daily stuff. That's more of a regional climate thing. Uh, variables, uh, upper atmosphere variables versus just temperature precip or maybe a few other variables. So that's a consideration that we kind of looked at. Regional consideration, this is one that Gary was concerned about, uh, that he was working in, in uh, uh, the Arctic and the climate was way, uh, weather was ju just doing wacky things that you'd never had seen before in the observations. So, and there weren't many weather stations up there. Uh, you might also get into wanting to do climate experiments. You know, not just use this to just simulate out to 2050, but do sensitivity experiments as well. And, and that's what regional climates are, models are really there for, to do experiments, be an experimental platform. Okay, so regional climate models. What they need is they, they're basically the same thing as a, the atmosphere part of a GCM, right? But instead of solving for the whole globe, you're, you're resolving those equations in a smaller area. But you need what is going on on the sides and the, and the base to provide, provide you boundary conditions and a starting point. And you typically get those from atmosphere, ocean, general circulation models. Again, we use the CMIP-3 stuff, and uh, there's the uh, emissions. Those are based on s reses as opposed to these RCPs. Okay, uh, we didn't really think that we'd want to run our own climate model, but there really wasn't much out there at the time. But there was this North American Regional Climate Change Assessment Program called NARCAP, and they did a bunch of runs at the A2 s res scenario. Some of you may be familiar with these data. It's 50 kilometer space data. Uh, it's, uh, they did historical climate and contemporary climate. Historical means that the boundary conditions actually came from actual observations instead of a GCM experiment. And so I'll just put that out there so those people that are familiar with it, that's kind of what they have there. And then they did contemporary climate based on a bunch of GCMs, and they did two 30-year periods, and again, the A2 emission scenario. And there's, you can get the data from those from Earth Systems Grid of several variables, three-hour resolution, again, 50-kilometer spatial resolution. This is kind of what their world looked like. So think that you're resolving the GCM atmospheric part in this area, and it's taking into account that the GCM says winds and moisture and heat are coming in from these edges and maybe coming out of other edges, and it's solving these equations of conservation of mass and so on. Computation relatively expensive. They used several different regional climate models, and then they had several different GCMs uh, that provided data for the boundary conditions. So they got a whole suite. This is bigger than when we were first working with this around 2010. They've added some more models. So this I just got. The list was shorter back then when we were first looking at this. So here's the prairie pothole region. This is our prism stuff again that we're using as our kind of baseline to compare things to. And here's... Uh, one of those NARCAS simulations, this is a model called WARF with CCSM out of NCAR, a GCM running given boundary conditions. And you can see it's they're, they're kind of simulating what climate is like pretty well here. There's their projection out in the future. One of the issues we had is that there was a big gap in the model output. And this 2000 to 2040 was actually a time period we're really interested in. So we're thinking, well, maybe we could fill that gap in and maybe we can attempt to approve precip. So I started looking at this weather research and forecasting model. Gary Clow was actually using it. This is the uh, uh, the advanced research wharf is what is used. There's also an operational version of it that's used by NOAA. 
And we wanted to set this up so we complemented some of the work with this model called RITCM that Steve Hotzeller was used in. So we wouldn't duplicate his efforts. We'd have extra data that we could also do comparisons to. Advanced Research Wharf. We had the, it just really needs a supercomputer. So we went to the University of Colorado. They have a community surface dynamics modeling system that Gary was already running Wharf on to simulate some of the weather systems in the Arctic. Uh, it's, it's got the USGS actually uh, it's got a this uh, silicon graphics computer, but uh, 128 nodes that the US act, USGS actually bought to help with these wharf simulations. So uh, uh, there was an investment there by the USGS. To give you an idea, a 50-year simulation takes about two months. So it takes a while to do just one simulation. Uh, the simulations we did were 36-kilometer uh, horizontal resolutions. We got 27 vertical levels, uh, four soil levels, and, and it... It solves like every minute, but it integrates and, and puts output about every three hours. So computationally, it's, it's making computations at a much finer resolution than three hourly. Um, Parker Norton is doing an analysis of if we used historical data to simulate, try to actually simulate the historic up. Um, he's actually did that from 1981 to 2010. That's called a reanalysis. Again, that's using observation to try to actually get things as accurate as Okay. Uh, all right. So there. So we did. We did a warp simulation uh, reanalysis. We also did this. This is what I'm really going to show you here is our contemporary projected climate. 81. So we did two runs, 81 to 2010, and then a, a projection out 20, 2000 to 2050. And we use CTSM as a boundary in initial conditions for this model. Why did we use that? Well, okay. So we had to make. A, we had to choose one GCM for boundary conditions. So here again is our, this is for the Great Plains, and this is our prism estimates of temperature and precip. So we looked at a bunch of different models. Uh, we had to choose one. You can't use an ensemble. You actually got to use a specific GCM. So I'm going to change just the color there to black. All right. Now, this is the uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory if you simulate, if you average up all the points in the Great Plains. And you can see that it's running cool and wet. So we looked at that and said, oh, OK, can we find maybe something that's doing better in the Great Plains? And then we looked at the Canadian Center for Climate Modeling, its GCM. And it's about the same in terms of its temperatures. It's still too cool. But it did a better job in terms of precip. Now, here is the Community Climate System model. This is the NCAR model. And it's doing much better in terms of temperature and it's doing much better in terms, it's doing okay in terms of precip. I'm going to get rid of all the others and just kind of show that. So that's the model that we selected because it seemed to actually produce the best results in the Great Plains. And I've got other projects that go down in Texas that I'm working on as well. So we really do span the Great Plains. Just to show you the latest SEMA 5 version of CCSM, which is called CCSM 4, that's what it looks like for the Great Plains. So it's given about the same story. It looks like it's still a little bit wetter still for the Great Plains. Uh, but anyways, that's what it looks like. So we used CCSM3 for this run that we did a few years back. OK. And just I wanted to throw in there. So here's the heat of 2012. That was a really hot year out there. Uh, just to put it in perspective, once you get out to around 2050, that's going to be a cool year, according to these models. So um, a little bit of a point of, of, of perspective on, on maybe what the future holds. Not much of a trend in precip. It's pretty darn flat, even though it's off, but it's, it's still relatively flat. OK, so that's our CCSM3 boundary and initial conditions. Um, this is just for anyone that's in the climate modeling community. The, one of the big things that, that has the uncertainty in these models is what's going on in a subgrid scale, less than 36 kilometers. And you, and you put in these packages that represent these subgrid scale. So we use CAM, which is what the GCM actually uses, and this Kane Fritch cumulus. We played a lot with these cumulus schemes to try to get cumulus right. A thunderstorm is much less than 36 kilometers. So you have to estimate cumulus precipitation with these. Uh, this is a non hydrostatic model. Uh, which means that you can run it at pretty fine resolutions. Um, get, and, and once you get down below five kilometers, you don't have to, it actually simulates up. So here's what the GCM looks like. That's a GCM world of, of North America. 
Now, this is our domain that we simulated. You can see we got a lot more detail in there, so we can simulate stuff up. I'm zooming in now to the Prairie Pothole region. Uh, one of the things I was thought was nice, and now we can actually see the Black Hills. You've got a lot more confidence in stuff that could actually see things. So here's the Prairie Pothole region for the U.S. Uh, before I was showing you Great Plains, so I'm kind of flip-flopping back. So this is temperature and precip uh, for each water year for the Prairie Pothole region. Um, I just changed it to black, so it'll jump out. There's the there's the GCM. That's the stuff I showed you before. And here's our wharf simulations in the darker line here. Temperature and then precip going out. I'm going to get rid of the GCM so you can just see that. So you can see we're doing a, pr a pretty good job in terms of getting the, the variability. We kind of miss peaks like that there in temperature. We're a little bit high in terms of precip. There's our biases, about a half a degree. Uh, too cool, and then about 76 uh, millimeters, a little too warm there. I just to go back to what we were showing before. There's the NARCAP stuff, so we did kind of improve precip here, and you can see the the temperature for NARCAP just kind of takes our stuff and keeps on going out. Shows a lot more variability there, though. Uh, in terms of seasonality, if I would take for every month the average for 1981 to 2000, the black line is the prism stuff, so that's kind of what we're trying to hit. The CCSM in terms of temperature was kind of generally running cool for almost every month except out in here. And then we're kind of wavering back and forth with our simulation there. So um, that's just giving an idea of the monthly kind of uh, bias that we have in the model. In terms of precip, again, the black line is precip. This is the GCM is relatively flat, didn't have much in the way of convective precip. We kind of overestimated it. But one of the things we did do was get rid of this bimodal distribution. You really don't see this in the Great Plains up to the north. but we got rid of that. So this is a map of what the last 10 years of our simulation looks like. And let's compare that to the first 10 years, 2000 and 2001. So this, the last 10 years, 2050 to 2041, now subtract the first 10 years and look at the temperature change, average temperature change, um, average annual temperature change at each point. And you can see that the, the, the real area of, at that, where the changes are the greatest is actually ends up being around that prairie pothole region. Precip is a little bit more of a, uh, a messy. It's not it doesn't show as consistent pattern. Here's actually the precip for that last 10 years, average annual precip for the last 10 years. And then, boy, there's quite a pattern here. It's showing that there's very little change in the potholes, but we got some drying areas. If we were to look at the previous decade, 2031 to 2040, it actually would show that things would have been a little bit wetter. So. And just this data is, it, we got it on the GeoData portal. We just kind of got a, we got a publication that's kind of going through their final parts of editing, and it will be available. Some other groups are using it, but we'll eventually have it available in the near future. And so I'm going to hand over to Susan now. Okay. Thank you, John. So now I'm going to focus in on the, the one of the avian components in our original study that was done. Um, I brought Valerie Steen on the project because she'd had a lot of experience in the prey potholes and also was beginning to be interested in um, species distribution modeling and actually talked her into doing this as a doctoral project. And so she's currently working under Barry Noon at Colorado State University and myself. We started out. Um, let me see. There we go. So the work that I'm going to be talking about today was funded by the NCC WSC and also by the Plains and Prairie Pothole Landscape Conservation Cooperative. They helped provide funding for um, some of Valerie's graduate work. And then at the end, I will talk about actually a new project that we have as well. So. For this part of the project, Valerie's been using breeding bird survey data and decided that there was enough data to look at 31 species of these, over 100 species of wetland-dependent birds, or 31 that had uh, enough data to use. And there are varying um, groups here, lots of waterfowl, lots of uh, shorebirds. We've got some grebes, bitterns. And she's building uh, species distribution models with the simple model of the probability of species occurrence being a function of climate variables, wetland variables, and land cover. 
she used uh, a quantitative technique called random forest, which is a classification tree algorithm, so it's not a regression. So for the species occurrence, to actually build the model, she used 40 years of breeding bird survey data for 77 routes. She partitioned those data into two sets, a model training set to sort of build the model, and then a model validation set to see how good these models are. And so basically every second year of the survey, since these surveys went through a long period of time, uh, was separated out into another data set. So we've got the training data set and the model validation set. For climate variables, um, for building this model, um, she used PRISM data that John introduced and decided on 18 different variables of, of temperature and precipitation. They're basically different seasonalities. So each of the four seasons, the full past year, either average temperature or total precip, five-year and 10-year means, and then also estimates of variability, the standard deviation in the five-year and 10-year. And the reason we wanted to look at variability is because these systems are so very dynamic in, in uh, whether or not there's water in some of these wetlands and how deep the water is. And that variability and those fluctuations are actually very important for the ecology of the wetlands. So the wetland and land cover variables uh, were derived from um, available data, National Wetlands Inventory, that was then sort of simplified into a basin coverage. And then also upland variables, basically whether it was the area was covered with grass, uh, grass and rangeland, or if it was covered with tilled cropland, developed, or trees. So for the wetland variables, there are several different types of wetlands, temporary, seasonal, semi-permanent. And if you combine them all, you consider those three types, palustrian wetlands. There's also lakes and rivers. And so we had nine different variables and combinations of those. She then wanted to test the fit of the models. You know, we've got the training set and the validation set. And so um, across those 31 species, the accuracy was anywhere from 69 to 94%. And the accuracy is sort of the ratio of the number of correctly predicted president presences to the total number of predictions. And then another way of looking at how good the models are is the, the standard statistic used with random forests, and that's the AUC. And anything over about a 0.7 is considered a good model. And across these 31 species, they range from 0.69 to 0.94. So I'd say they're reasonably good models. So she's got the model. She then applied it to historical climate, so the period of 1981 to 2000, and then applied it to a decade in the future with the projected climate. So for the projected climate, we use two different uh, climate models. So we use some statistically downscaled data provided to us by the Forest Service of the Canadian model, the CGCM, and John mentioned that one earlier as being reasonably good for the plains. And we started with this before John's data were available, and when his became available, we then used his regional climate model based on the CCSM3. Both of these were with the A2 emission scenario. Now the reason we chose those two down, er, models and then the, either the down, statistically downscaled or the region of climate model was based on John's prior analysis to see which of these models work the best for the prey potholes. And so you see prism um, precipitation here, the mean and, and uh, standard deviation and range, I think. Um, with a CCSM, which is what he used for his WARF model, the Canadian model, and the GFDL was, was not as good. So our goal here was not to just span the total range of possible scenarios, but rather to find the models that are working the best for the region. And I'll come back to this point in the future when we talk about our, our new work. Now just to sort of orient you on the landscape, with the wetlands and the land coverage. Um, so you see a map here, or coverage of the prairie pothole region of North Dakota, South Dakota, and Western Minnesota. 
And the areas in green are where there's a lot of grassland, and you see that that is coincident with the Missouri Coteau over on the western part. And there's also a lot of wetlands over on the western part. So the next maps that I'll show you, you'll kind of maybe keep in mind the, the more the western part, the Coteau regions are where a lot of the grasslands with high wetland content as well. And then there are some areas of, of a lot of tilled agriculture, maybe even 60 or more percent of the landscape is, you know, maybe even more than 80 percent in some regions of the landscape is tilled, much flatter, and in some cases fewer wetlands. So let's just look at what the climate content was for the models that she was projecting to. So again, she projected these, the species distribution models that she built to the historical climate, and we have temperature on top, precipitation on the bottom. So you see your expected hot to cool gradient going south to north in temperature. And precipitation, there's also a gradient sort of northwest to southeast. It gets wetter as you get to the southeast. So the Montana area is drier. Western North Dakota is drier. These are actual temperatures and actual precip. This is not this particular um, uh, slide does not show change. It's the actual. I want to point out here that in the future, both the Canadian model and John's Wharf model show increasing temperatures. Um, let's see. There we go. For the Canadian model, is about a three degree average increase by the decade 2040 to 2050, and the Wharf model about a four degree. And one thing to point out is that you do see that where the orange and red areas are here, this is where the temperature exceeds the range that we saw during the historic period. So that I just wanted to point that out. Precipitation actually doesn't change uh, very much. There's maybe only a 2 or 3% increase in precipitation um, in the future in that particular decade. Another thing I want to point out is that the Canadian model and John's model, you know, are not terribly different here. So now for the model results. The way we're going to express this is in terms of how much of the range of this of a given species has been reduced as you go from the historical time period into the future. And the range we uh, reduction we sort of define as when the probability of occurrence drops from greater than half to less than half. And you can see here on the scale that we have graded even more than that. So basically, the areas that are brown is where the probability is more than half, more than 0.5. And the darker the brown, the higher the probability of occurrence. Where it's green, it is less than half. And the lighter the green, the less likely it is to see the bird there. So this is an example of the historical distribution uh, for one species. And across these 31 species, they, they really varied in, in how much of their range would be lost with this climate change. So here we're showing, again, the Canadian model and John's model for the 2040 to 2050 decade. And there's a set of species, five of them here, that lose less than 20% of their range. And the bird that is highlighted in, in bold here, that's the one that the model, the maps are for. Um, the other ones also had 20% or less range reduction. Their maps could vary quite a bit, but I'm just going to illustrate it by one in each group. The numbers in parentheses are showing the actual range reduction with the two different climate models, the Canadian model and the Wharf model. And in many places, in many situations, for many of these birds, it doesn't change a lot between the two. But there are some, like the gadwall here is like, you know, really wildly different between the two models. Uh, the gadwall is one that the, the model wasn't very good to begin with. There are more species that had more reduction in their ranges. And so the common yellow throat is illustrated in this group of slides. Do so you see the the amount of uh, area where you expect to see the bird has declined uh, through time. And it seems to be declining throughout. It's not just shifting north, but rather just kind of declining throughout. There's 
more birds, uh, another set of eight birds here that experience a 40 to 60 percent expected range reduction, which is pretty dramatic. And then we get to some that 60 to 80 percent, and some that are even going to experience up to 100 percent of their range reduction. If you look at the uh, the most sensitive birds here, you'll see uh, some birds that, like the sedge wren, the sora rail in particular, that do really like shallow water habitats. And the black tern evidently is very, um, it likes a lot of fluctuating water levels, and so if it gets too dry and the waters don't fluctuate. So what is responsible for these range reductions? So the way Random Forest gives you the, the findings is it, it, tell, it ranks the variables of importance. And so there are, remember there are 18 climate variables and nine uh, wetland and upland variables. And it, for each species, you can look at what are the top 10 variables that affect and this would be in the building phase of the model, that affect these birds' distribution. And if you look at, and now instead of having five categories of how much range reduction, uh, Valerie broke it into three, those that experience the most range reduction, those that are moderate, and those that experience the least range reduction. And the ones that uh, experience the most range reduction are actually the ones that are more sensitive to temperature and precip. In almost all cases, it was a negative relationship with temperature. The hotter it got, the, the smaller, the, the more constricted the distribution. Precipitation kind of went both ways, depending on the ecology of the species. But it was still the wetland coverages that really defined a lot of the distribution of these birds to begin with. So remember this wetland coverage, it's the, the wetland basins. It's not whether or not there's water in the wetlands, but just the wetland basins um, that are available for water uh, based on National Wetlands Inventory data. So we have a lot of, uh, of interpreting of these um, figures to do. We, we do see that in the group that is the least, uh, experiencing the least range reduction, we'll have um, Birds like the ruddy duck or the redhead diving ducks that like the big water, and they were not really very responsive to changes in temperature and precipitation because the big water might be a little bit smaller, but it's still pretty big. They're in a lot of the semi-permanent wetlands. I also want to mention here just to clarify that we are seeing temperature and precipitation more as a surrogate for how much water there's probably in these wetlands. Uh, temperature could also be affecting the birds physiological, physiologically if it gets too hot. Well, there's still a lot to be done on, on this in this area. Um, and in fact, we have a new project that is being funded by the North Central Climate Science Center where we're going to be using some of the same species distribution models, actually building on them, and then asking a question about the use of surrogate species to manage for wetland-dependent birds in the prey pothole region. We've assembled a team, again, myself, Barry Noon and Valerie, a postdoc, Helen Sofair. John is, again, helping us with the project with the climate data. And we're also working with uh, Dr. Ben Rashford from University of Wyoming, who's an economist. And uh, he has a postdoc working with him, Gordon Reese. And we have many very important partners here, the Plains and Prairie Potholes Landscape Conservation Cooperative, the PPJV, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, all of the uh, participating states, tribes, and NGOs that the LCC is, is currently working with. So the question for this work really did come out of, of what the, uh, the people that know a lot about the prey potholes, the researchers, at the Habit Office in Bismarck and the managers um, have been wondering about. So historically, a lot of the, the wetland management has been done based on waterfowl distributions, and primarily these five species of waterfowl. And they'll identify areas on the landscape where you can expect very high densities of ducks and try to protect as much of that habitat as they can through wetland easements and other mechanisms. But they're wondering, do waterfowl effectively serve as surrogates for other species? Now, we have 
16 species of, of, of wetland-dependent birds that we need to, to think about. So the idea of surrogate species uh, as a tool in management is something that's really uh, very much in the forefront in the Fish and Wildlife Service these days. They recognize it's impossible to manage for every species, so you need to select some to really focus on. But this approach assumes similar habitat needs, and it should assume similar responses to ecological change if, in fact, we're going to be looking at how climate change is affecting these. So the objectives of this new study is to test the use of surrogate species, both under contemporary and projected climate and land use scenarios, and then to help the managers assess whether the conservation areas that they currently have purchased for waterfowl can also provide habitat into the future for other species. So we're going to do some major uh, improvements on these basic species distribution models that Valerie has done, and she will be working on this project and continuing her doctorate. The um, North Central Climate Science Center has some very good uh, computer resources, and we will be using what is called the software for assisted habitat modeling to expand on the number of statistical approaches to species distribution modeling we can use. So in addition to random forest, we can use logistic regression, max and boosted regression trees, and other ones. And there has been quite a bit of attention in this world of species distribution modeling, you know, how the different statistical techniques actually um, end up uh, portraying these distributions. We want to use additional climate projections as well. So we have two currently that we selected based on what is probably the, the best climate data you can get for that area. And we're working in consultation with the climate working group of the uh, Climate Science Center to um, select some additional um, climate projections. And then from that, we will probably compare how all of these different climate projections and um, statistical uh, packages yield results to see how much variability there is, to get a sense of you know, how much uncertainty there is. But we'll probably also be working with ensemble models. And just very briefly, I want to talk about some other uh, additions to this effort. Dr. Helen Sofer is currently working on a layer to project the condition of the wetlands, that's how much water is in the wetlands, using May pond counts. And this is an effort that's also being worked on by Neil Nemeth at the Happet office in Bismarck. He's uh, using a different approach that is also bringing in some of the tiling and drainage uh, uh, information that he has, and we're, we're anxious to see how that transpires. And then uh, Dr. Rashford is going to be developing models of land use change based on remotely sensed data, these biophysical variables, but also economic theory of how crops might change, and especially as uh, ethanol has been sort of a, a big influence up there. So he will be uh, providing us with a layer of future projected land use as well. And then finally, we're going to develop tools where we can take all these species distribution models, these much improved species distribution models, compare them with the surrogate species that the managers select, and actually build a tool and integrate that software into the Climate Science Center infrastructure. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the wonderful support that we've gotten from the NCCWSC, the PPPLCC, now the uh, Climate Science Center, and also the Habit Office, the Forest Service for providing a lot of data. And Lucy Burris did a lot of the GIS support and data management for the project. And that is it. Does anyone have any questions? Excellent. Thank you, Susan and John. This is Norman. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Excellent. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation. and. Um, John, uh, you did a great job of sort of laying the groundwork, which I think gets glossed over a lot of times on this stuff, about all the complexities of the, the GCMs and the downscaling and all those kind of things. That was really great. He's um, really good at that. <laughs> it's a you. lot of stuff. It's like trying to feed, take a small sip from a fire hose is the analogy that comes to mind. Yeah. 
Um, Susan, I was um, wanted to see if I could clarify something from you, and I may have just missed this, but um, I was I'm really unclear on how the um, the variables that come out of the GCMs, like precipitation and temperature, actually get integrated, if you will, through your modeling into the range reductions is it is it, is it a mechanistic mechanistic model that has things like you know how often are these pot holes you know three inches deep or greater and or how often are they um, the temperatures above a certain amount I, I kind of lost where that linkage is and how, and what how mechanical it is and how and so on yeah it's it at this point in time it's basically correlative you know um, okay. We don't have a mechanistic model here, and that's what we're hoping to get some more insights with, with Helen Sofer's work and with Neil Nemeth's work, and there are other people in the potholes working on a lot of these questions as well. So right now, we just we pull out the variables from the, the uh, climate data, you know, express it in terms of monthly data, and then repackage it to form the variable like, okay, in the last year, how much total water was in this grid cell? what was the average temperature in the last year or in in different seasons or five-year or ten-year periods. And so that just goes into building the model. And so these these original, like the training set, is what was used to build the model. So it was just it, – it's random forest, which is different from an aggression analysis, but I think the analogy is the same. It just – you know, it's, it's more of a correlation than a mechanistic model. Okay. And then, um, so she would build the model and then project the model using new climate data. So you, you know, you have your definition of your model and then you just go and, and apply your future average temperature for each different time period, you know, relative to what the model says. Okay. I'm sure that was clear as mud. So well, you have um, Valerie's... Um, email and she's also she's got a paper that's been in review for some time on this it's um it's still undergoing some revisions now um but i'm sure that she'd be happy to talk to you about more details too okay that helps thank you very much mm -hmm. hi, hi jeff hi so not such a question but a compliment to say i thought it was a really good job i really i agree with the previous comment that john does a great job going into those details that are often glossed over and to uh, appreciate NIGWISC's funding of a project that will then lead to useful climate data that we'll use in the North Central. And then to put in a, uh, um, uh, a shameless plug that that SOM software that Susan mentioned, uh, there's training every six months at the USGS Four Collins Science Center. Uh, I think the next training is coming up uh, March 25th, 6th, and 7th, and it, it's posted through the DOI Learn website. So with that question and maybe others that are interested in learning more about that, that is um, something that will be ongoing, uh, offered as, as information on that software and those tools. Um, we had a uh, question come in from Sonia Hall, and she says, are you considering looking at the potential impacts of climate change on the wetland variables? A student at the University of Washington, Megan Hobiski, working with Josh Lawler and Alan Hamlet are looking at this question in Washington State. Using a combination of the high resolution images to map, map wetlands Landsat to describe dynamics and climate change projections. Um, we don't have a, a effort that is quite that um, that energetic. It sounds like a wonderful effort. Uh, Helen Sofair is currently using the May Pond Count data, which is a Fish and Wildlife Service survey that's been going on since 1957 um, that looks at sort of number of ponds in the area, which is kind of an index of how much water there is. Um, and she'll be using using that. So it'll be kind of an index, but it, uh, at this point in time, I, I would love to have, you know, a, a model that really can help relate climate directly to what the water levels in the region are, in the in the wetlands in the region. One of the real difficult things 
in in that model and why I think it hasn't been um, approached quite that in that in that way is that in these agricultural areas, there's a lot of tiling and draining that goes on that basically overrides any effect of the climate in a localized area. And I don't think there are very accurate coverages of where this activity has has gone on. Um, and I think it, it covers a good percentage, you know, probably less than 20, maybe even less than 10 of the potholes based on a, a paper I just saw. But um, anyway, I, I would love to, to see an effort like that. And I think there's a lot of other folks working on these mechanistic models that hopefully will come up with, with some of these projections. And I'll, I'll just chime in here just a little bit. The, the dynamical models have got a, a fair bit of hydrologic variables. They've got to cycle moisture and, and so on through there. Uh, Susan and I had a discussion with Joe Barsugli and Noah just the other day, just two days, yesterday? Yesterday. It's going flying. But anyways, we were talking about the importance of actually using these hydrologic variables out of the models. One thing to remind folks is is that you know we do these runs that are based on these climate experience experiments with GCMs, but there's also these reanalyses that kind of do a pretty good job of simulating historic climate changes. Um, so those some they can provide some things along the lines of soil moisture and and so on that we're kind of discussing maybe bringing into some of these um, uh, tree what's it called tree. Model. Random forest. Random forest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm an atmospheric science. Yeah. Uh, random forest. Uh, th those kinds of models. Trying to bring those kinds of hydrologic variables into the models. And I'd like to just add, um, Jennifer Rover up at Aeros Data Center in South Dakota is actually doing a, a project at a smaller scale, maybe two counties within North Dakota, Stutzman and Kidder counties, um, in conjunction with some other researchers. Uh, that's looking at that type of a, of an effort, and it'd be really nice to to see how she develops a methodology that perhaps we can expand out over a, a larger region. Excellent, thank you. All right, Holly or Sean, are you still on the line? Yeah, we are, and. Um no comments from us other than just to thank Susan and John for a wonderful presentation. Well, you're welcome. Thank, thank you, you for giving us the opportunity to give it. Yes, thank you very much. Great. Great. Thank you, everybody. And I just wanted to say thank you to the participants as well.